Okay, we're recording. Great. Um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Kingdoms Control Board. It's uh, Monday, March 7th at 11 a.m. and uh, I call this meeting to order. So uh, first thing, um, I need to add an item to today's agenda. We're going to take a second look at our health warning and consider a possible amendment. It's in rule two. Um, so I'd like to add that after we do the walkthrough of three and four, but before public comment. Um, so I guess the big news um, since we last met um, is just that, you know, roughly 40 towns voted on town meeting day to permit retail cannabis shops within their borders. And the overwhelming majority of those towns voted yes in favor. Um, and we know that there are a lot of questions that that raises um, for these towns um, and also the prospective licensees um, about the local control issues. Um, we do work fairly closely with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns um, so that they are a good resource to reach out to about these issues. Um, we also have an FAQ document on the home screen of our website. Um, it's uh, ccb.vermont.gov. You know, those have answers to most of the frequently asked questions. Um, and you can also always submit additional questions to the board. Um, we do all look at those questions. When we see kind of reoccurring themes, we try to um, you know, create new FAQ responses to those. Um, we also have our next social equity and economic empowerment networking event on Thursday, this Thursday, March 10th from 5 to 7 p.m. It's a totally virtual event. We don't have in-person attendance at those. Um, the link, uh, the RSVP is available on our website. The topic uh, this week is going to be about energy and sustainability issues um, that are that are in our rules. And Kyle, do you want to just say a little bit more about? The yeah. Well, I'm excited to, to take my turn in facilitating, leading, whatever you want to call it, one of these really awesome events. We're going to have uh, Barry Murphy from the Public Service Department there who um, did a lot of, of heavy lifting when it came to informing the board and um, our subcommittee um, when it comes to energy regulations. And, you know, we adopted a lot of PSDs, um, you know, break their suggestions that they gave the subcommittee to look over before it came to the board. We'll also have Jacob Pulitzer from the Cannabis Conservancy. He was our um, our leader on the environment or the sustainability subcommittee. Um, and he, again, has been working in this industry for a considerable amount of time, um, you know, is an energy focused guy. Um, so, so Barry and Jacob are going to tag team trying to demystify what some of the terminology means, trying to help folks get comfortable with some of the requirements. Um, and Barry can kind of signal how um, his department really looks to help people understand when you know, CDs apply, something along those lines. Um, so I'm excited about having them there to kind of help people get comfortable with the requirements. We're also going to have a team from Efficiency Vermont there that will give a, a, a broad presentation on the various different rebates and services and programs that they offer. And then, you know, I've heard that they're looking to make some special accommodations for, for social equity applicants moving forward, which is really exciting. And they're, they're uh, really happy to do so. So um, we'll learn more about all of that on Thursday. I'm looking forward to it. That's great. Yeah. And just a reminder, we don't record those sessions. Um, you know, they are designed to help kind of facilitate open conversation. And so, um, you know, please just sign up and try and join, even if it's just on in the background while you're cooking dinner or something like that. And hear about this kind of very important aspect of the industry. Um, so just the last announcement again is just that our pre Qualification application window opens on March 16th. Um, we have uh, some good information up on our website about what that means and what's going to be required in that stage. Um, there's still a few issues that we're working out internally, so we're not ready to open it right now, but we'll open it on March 16th. But just a basic kind of overview. Um, we expect to have an online form. Um, there will be kind of a paper backup if that's what people want to use, but you know, we will have, you can apply online through our website. The fee will also probably most likely be online with uh, kind of a backup of money orders or check or checks, uh, which we'll have more guidance about as the date approaches. 
Um, because we don't have our federal authorization from the FBI quite yet, we are going to need to do fingerprints both for pre-qualification if you choose to be pre to pre-qualify um, and at the kind of operational licensing application stage. So, um, and uh, you also have to kind of go through VCIC, their website, and um, kind of do a, a Vermont-based background check. So it's a little bit frustrating that that's the case, um, just that, you know, you know, folks that are looking to do this will have to kind of get fingerprinted twice, um, but that's just the kind of state of things currently. And, um, you know, beyond that, we're just asking that you submit an, a basic operating plan. All this will be laid out in the application itself. And um, again, there's some very uh, helpful guidance on our website about what we're looking for and what this means. And just a reminder that this is a voluntary process. Um, we're not, there's no need to pre-qualify, especially if you're a small cultivator and looking to apply in April, um, you know, pre-qualification probably um, is not the right move, but you can do whatever you'd like. Um, other than that, I think just uh, we need to approve the minutes from our last meeting, which I believe was February 22nd, 2022. You guys had a chance to look those over? Yep. Um, take a motion to approve. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, let's move to the agenda then. Um, today, we're going to do a walkthrough of the kind of remaining issues, the kind of final sweep of um, public comments um, around rules three and four, and hopefully um, get those voted on today so they can move on. <laughs> Prepared to walk through so. some of those final changes? Yes, let me plug in here and we'll get going. All right, so we'll go through like we have in the past and uh, just note what the changes are. Um, and all you're we'll be looking up here at a clean copy of uh, the rule subsequent to the changes as adopted by or not yet adopted, but as discussed by the board um, uh, regarding the various public comment. Requests. I'm just pulling up my documents here. So there were not a huge amount, as you, as folks remember, not a huge amount on Rule Three. But I'll just go through the few that we had. Um, and there's some stuff that's really purely technical or grammatical. <clears throat> with a couple things that I won't bother talking too much about. But if you have any questions, the board has any questions, let me know. So first change we have here is the definitions uh this is actually a comment that was given to rule four but is applies to rule three as well a commenter noted that it would make sense to have the caregiver definition track more closely with the patient definition patient definition as you'll see uh talks about um or defines it as somebody who has a registration card uh board agreed that that made sense to use that format and the caregiver definition as well so the caregiver care, excuse me caregiver definition now reads caregiver means a resident of vermont who has been issued a caregiver registration card by the board identifying the person as someone who has agreed to undertake responsibility for managing the well-being of a patient with respect to the use of cannabis or cannabis products for symptom relief so that is change one i'll move along here We have a ways to go to get to the next one. We're looking at, we're going to look at 3.5.3. We'll get there. Three point five point three. There we go. So this was a question about uh, maintaining records and a commenter had noted that uh, maintaining records is not part of the adult maintaining records of people who purchase cannabis at retail establishments is not part of the adult use 
scheme and questioning about whether that needed to remain in the scheme for dispensaries. Um, and the way this was written, it sort of exempted anything that was an integrated license from that. So it had turned it into a really narrow piece. Uh, I think some feedback we, or, and I should say this was an open question in the, at the end of the last board meeting about what to do. And we wanted to gather some information from medical staff. Medical staff had noted that there is good enforcement reason to want to ensure that people who are buying product from medical dispensaries are in fact patients because patients do get to do, they have access to products that the general adult use market does not have access to and also have access to things like delivery and so forth that the adult use market does not currently have access to. And so for that reason, they noted that there could be some enforcement benefit to retaining this requirement. Um, in accordance with that comment, this read now reads the following. I wanted to make it um, so that there was, if we were going to have the requirement, it made sense to have it exist for any patient, not including people at integrated licensees. So it now reads, a record shall be maintained of all individuals who purchase cannabis or cannabis products from the dispensary, provided that when an integrated licensee operates a dispensary location that also serves an adult use retail location, records related to adult use customers shall not violate the provisions of rule 2.3.8. And that's basically a, a way of saying that you won't keep records on adult use patients because to, rule 2.3.8 says, 2.8.3, sorry, says uh, that the limits the types of records that can be kept for adult use patients. And then it just notes what the record should contain if uh, the person is a patient. So, um, I'd actually open it up for board discussion since this well, there was, I don't think there really was a final decision by the board on this. This uh, is a proposal in accordance with where the discussion sort of ended up based on information gathered from staff. This makes sense to me. Yeah, no, I mean, I think where we left things are we were gonna talk to the medical team and ask the genesis of this and the, the need for it. And I think we heard that and it makes sense to me too. Agreed. Sounds good. Moving on to 3.5.5, quantity limits. Um, so uh, there was comments about the quantity limits more generally, and one thing that came out of that was that it made sense to do in this rule what we've done elsewhere, which is instead of importing statutory requirements directly into the rule, reference the statute because statutes change, and that'll make it easier for folks trying to stay in, in um compliance with the law to make sure that we don't end up with contradictions between statute and rule. One way to do that is to reference the statute instead of restating in the rule what the statute says at this moment in time. So this was rewritten to say, in a single transaction, dispensaries may provide no more cannabis than a patient is permitted to possess in accordance with any limit set by that statute, uh, section 952 no more than the equivalent in cannabis products or no more than the permitted limit in a combination of cannabis and the equivalent in cannabis product. So it's basically exactly the same as what was there before, just restated. Um, what would happen if that statute was repealed? Then this would, effectively, this would just go away because it says in accordance with any limit set by okay. this yeah. statute, and if there's no limit set by that statute, then there's no limit. Uh, one other thing we had here was 3.8. This is a new section, um, and this is just uh, putting in language that we've had for every other entity or person who's involved in the market, which is just that you have to disclose your information if it changes between your application and renewal periods or between your renewal periods. That's true for dispensaries, for cannabis establishments, uh, for cannabis card ID holders, and now we're making clear that it is will also be true for patients and caregivers, and the language is the same as it is for everybody else there. This, and that, I, can't, I can't remember. Did we give it a time frame for for people on the adult rec side? For how quickly we need to update? Yeah. We haven't given any timelines in any of these. Not do it here. And that's it for rule three. Um, open it up for any other discussion.
we go back to um, employee training? Which is not the title of the section. Which is <laughs> I will get there. So it is found in 3.4.3b. So um, <clears throat> in the current DPS rule, um, there's a requirement for confidentiality training for employees of dispensaries, and I'd like to keep that. It doesn't appear here. That's good. And then, um, for patient education, that's not included in Rule 3, and it is in um, the current DPS rule. And I think, and David could explain this better than I, but I think we can just take what's in the current DPS rule and, and put it in Rule 3 so that patient education is still part of this rule. Any discussion? Is it, do we know what that looks like in practice? Um, I don't. I mean, I don't. I I thought about it for a while. I would because I know that we talked about it in some of our medical subcommittee mm -hmm. and, yeah. in different conversations. Um, what it says is that there has to be patient education that includes like methods of dosing, okay. um, like strains and terpene and okay. things like that. Um, it's not necessarily substantially different than the flyer that we've talked about, yeah. but I think it would. At least with patient education, would specifically probably address the high THC, high yeah. potency THC uh, products that only dispensaries can sell. Yeah, I think it's it's a good thing to include. Same. Okay. Sounds good. We'll make those changes. Ready to go to rule four? Sure. All right. So moving through rule four, we've got a few changes here. First, we start at um, the definition section. We got rid of the definition of cannabis license agent because that is no longer relevant. It's no longer part of the rules. We also made the same change to caregiver that I just discussed, the definition of caregiver that I just discussed in rule three. Moving to 4.3, there were a number of changes made here and throughout the rules, I should say, that address a comment that the board agreed made sense to um, re be responsive to, which was that rule four was is not always clear that the board has the power to uh, take enforcement action against cannabis establishment identification card holders. So those individuals who've effectively also been licensed by the board to work at cannabis establishments. Board agreed that was a fair point. And so here and elsewhere, and I won't necessarily point out every single one, but I'll point out a few of them as we go through. Changes have been made to make it clear that this does apply to, uh, to cannabis establishment identification card holders as well. So an example is in this section, it now, it used to just say licensees shall cooperate. Now it says licensees and cannabis establishment identification card holders shall cooperate. So, and the same with 4.3.2, the same change was made. So that's one example. Um, and there's a number of other examples later in the rule, which we'll, we can touch on briefly, but if any questions come up about that, we can talk more about it. Uh, one other place where that change, uh, <laughs> There, a change was made to accommodate that point is 4.4.2 subsection C and D added that reference again to cannabis establishment ID card holders. Uh, moving on to 4.5.1, just the category one, the uh, category one violations. Um, and a number of these, I would say, are really quite technical. There is a change to H to make sure that the citation was correct. Uh, and also just to use the same language that we've been using elsewhere in the rules with regard to control. Um, we deleted one section because we thought it was repetitive. 
uh, in a couple places where it says selling, we added transferring in addition to selling because we use that language consistently throughout the rules, selling or transferring. And there was a number of times where this section and other sections said cannabis, and we've been consistently referencing cannabis or cannabis product as the phrase we use to reference the regulated substance. Um, a change that we made throughout is that we added correction, corrective action plan as an option pretty much anywhere. Because uh, a commenter pointed out that even if there's something as severe as a suspension, you may also want to require a corrective action plan to make sure the person has a or the entity, whatever it is, has a plan to not make the same mistakes or commit the same violation again. So that's been added in. And then there's also on all of the uh, penalty sections, it as an and or to make sure that uh, the board could do multiples of, you know, so it could be a corrective action plan and a suspension, for example. Yeah. Can I ask a question about that as it relates to the ID card? So right now the ID card is attached to the license. And if, um, if the board provides a corrective action plan instead of a fine or suspension of the card, does that have any impact on the at-will status of the employee because we're providing a plan to correct instead of the employer doing that? I mean, we're, the, we're a regulating entity that has authority to enforce compliance with our rules. How an employer decides to deal with an employee who has brought them out, you know, gone out of compliance with the um, regulating entity with us uh, is going to be up to the employer and not something that we really have control over. I think it would be the equivalent to any regulated entity where like if a lawyer, for example, to take my own profession, got in trouble with the professional responsibility board, they have to do whatever the professional responsibility board requires them to do. And then if they work at a law firm or at the cannabis control board, for example, uh, it would be up to their <laughs> employer, the law firm or the board or whatever, it, wherever it is they're working to decide how they're going to address that employee issue and that could be that but that's fully within the control of the employer and not something that the board can could interfere with so there's no correction that we could come up with that would also um uh limit the employer's ability to do what they need to do and what do you mean when you, the ability to do what they need to well, do what are you thinking about what they well if they wanted to, to terminate employment right based on a corrective action plan. There's no correction that we could come up with as a board that would limit their ability to do no, that. Okay. We couldn't interfere with that. Okay. Not knowing what a corrective action plan is going to look like, that's no idea what the realm of possibilities are there. Right. No, it would be fully up to the employer to decide what they want to do. And if they wanted to terminate that employee, they could do that. Um, moving on to our next section. Again, a lot of sort of technical changes here. I don't think we need to go through every single one. Uh, one of the changes we made that's slightly more substantive and technical is to subsection D. And it, elsewhere in the rules, we made it clear that we're in this case, we actually are going to uh, keep the language quite close to what the statute says in order to be a little bit more uh, accommodating of the realities of how people are going to move around cannabis establishments, including cannabis establishments that may be at somebody's home. And so for that reason, subsection D was rewritten to uh, adopt that language from elsewhere. It now says, allowing a person under 21 years of age to enter a transport vehicle or a building or enclosure on the premises of a cannabis establishment where cannabis or cannabis product is located, um, there's, you know, that's, that's a violation. Um, and then there's a carve out for patients' registry cards. Uh, but that was that now imitates the language elsewhere in the rule, and that does allow a little more flexibility. Any questions about that one? No. Nope. There are a couple of subsections that are added here, and again, these are in response to board discussions that didn't quite come to a conclusion at the last meeting, but there were two questions that came up, which was basically that, that were heard by other comments. Um, and they were basically, the questions were, do we have a sufficient uh, um, provision that names 
the issue of unlawful or unauthorized cannabis products. So like somebody selling something, an inhalant that uh, had an ingredient that was not allowed under our guidance, which we're going to be, we'll be putting forward. Uh, or something, or sort of a more general issue around testing requirements, or general statement of testing requirements. And I reviewed it and felt that, in fact, we did not have sufficient language on those two pieces. That's not to say, I do think that under our, uh, I have two things to say about that generally. One is that the board does have the power to, um, if there's a violation that isn't named in these subsections, you still do have the power to issue a notice of violation and to put it into the category that makes sense. Um, so that's present. And I did think that there were ways we could have gotten at these issues without um, including this, but that clarity is always good. Naming things plainly is always good. And adding these two subsections in response to those board comments, I thought did make sense after reviewing the full subsection. So I'd open that up to uh, any discussion if there is any. This is a category two violation. This is in category two, and, and that's something that you could discuss too. It makes sense. I think there's certainly a difference between intentionally doing this versus doing it unintentionally. Okay. Well, isn't that where we have different options in terms of you know, how we enforce it, not how we enforce it, but um, with the violations? We do have three options here yeah. um, for this. So, yes, I just, I wonder if doing, you know, selling a, let's just say a vape cartridge with vitamin E has to get in it, you know, something that we know is potentially deadly, um, whether that should result in a fine or whether that should be a potential suspension or relocation. And I say that because, you know, the, the original the underlying intent of what we're doing here was a consumer safety angle. I mean, we, we know that there's a lot more to the legislative intent of Act 164. But the original kind of motivation was to kind of protect consumer safety. But I don't know. So I think you're right. There's a difference between cutting corners and doing this intentionally right. and then getting a product and not having truthful information. Right. So I guess my question is, I mean, and maybe this isn't a question we can't answer now, who ultimately would be responsible for the selling or transferring of the product? Is it the retailer? Is it right. the, is exactly. it all the way down the supply chain? Is it the ID card holder? Like who, who's the one who would pay the penalty? Is it the ID card holder? And I have no idea that's what's going to result from and you know, some kind of training or personal action is warranted. But if it's a manufacturer, we know what we're doing. That's what I, mean. I almost feel like we just don't have to include this. Right. You can look at the facts of the case and, and decide how, how severe you know, the kind of punishment that's required or you know, sanction that's required. Yeah, I agree. I think I think facts can be so variable in this type of thing, right. especially. You know, depending on if the retailer holds its own manufacturing license versus, um, you know, um, understanding that relationship. And, yeah. David, do you have any kind of advice for us about if we were to leave this out? Um, are we not being clear enough? Are we kind of being too vague with people that this is something that we're going to take very seriously? I mean, I. Certainly, you're still going to retain the authority to bring a violation against somebody who, who does this. I am always in favor of, of making it plain where things are and what you're going to do. I think that, but it, it's obviously your decision. I mean, you could take it out and you would still retain the authority to, to commit the violation. But I think some of the problems you're talking about are going to exist, whether it's written or not written. 
And so I think it might make sense to add something like knowingly selling or transferring unauthorized or unlawful product, because then that sort of, um, or you could put it, you could divide it into two, like you've done out, like it is elsewhere, where there's a where there's an intentional one that's in one category and an unintentional one that's in a lower category. Uh, so I think there's a number of ways. I think those are fair points uh, about who should bear the burden in terms of enforcement. And I think there's a couple other ways that you could deal with it that I would think will work better and will provide more warning than just deleting it entirely. I like adding knowingly. I was going to say, even adding knowingly can kind of help zone in on maybe the manufacturer knew the retailer didn't, maybe they both know and they're both culpable. You know what I mean? So, um, at least in that given example. Yeah. I don't know what you think, but if we're going to do knowingly what i i mean i think knowingly should be a class one category one violation and then this kind of more general intent crime of selling or general intent violation could be a class two recognizing that you know we have the authority to kind of fit the sanction to the the crime or the kind of violation so a class one, category one, doesn't necessarily mean automatic suspension of the revocation license. It could be a fine or it could be a corrective action plan. You know? right. um, so yeah, I would say if we're going to do it this way, David, that we would do knowingly selling or transfer, transferring as a category one and that would be the way it is here. That sounds good. Okay. With that. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's all it. The best that we can without a specific set of yeah. facts right now. Yeah. We will do that. Um, moving on to the next changes here. Um, subsection L of 4.5.3 seemed to be exactly, sorry, let me go down there first. It seemed to be exactly the same as. Um, uh oh, well, now it's changed, of course. Um, I'm going to read it out for you. That'd be great if you. It said exceeding maximum serving requirements for cannabis or cannabis products. Thank you. And that seemed to be exactly the same as a uh, category two violation we already had. So I thought it made sense to just, which was the um, uh, transaction limit part of uh, number of category two. And uh, that was subsection, it still is subsection I of category two. So we just thought it made sense to rely on that, but I did want to um, bring that forward. It's not the exact same, obviously. The transaction limit, you know, one ounce or the equivalent per transaction. This could be, I mean, maybe it's the same. This could be putting. 100 milligrams of THC into a single package, labeling it as 50 or something along those lines. I don't know why you should do that. But. That's what you're saying. So it's not the exact same, but you know, there's certainly similar aspects. No, I think that makes sense. Let's keep them both just in case okay. such a hypothetical ever comes forward. Um, the next change is not for a little while. On the aggravating and mitigating factors, um, which is 4.7, anywhere that it said licensee, it now says person. And again, the point of that is to make sure that we're being clear that this could apply to cannabis establishment ID holder, card holders and not just licensees. Uh, you could argue that licensee was intended to include the ID card holder, but I think this is a clearer way to write it. And the other reality is that, um, as we discussed in the last meeting, the board could take an action against somebody who is not a licensee at all, who is operating without in an unlicensed manner. So I think this is just a better way to say it. Sure. Moving to the next changes. We go to the issuance of a notice of violation and 4.8.4, the sufficiency of service piece. 
Um, this has been reorganized a little bit, but there actually isn't much substantive change except to say that um, we're making clear that uh, you can achieve adequate notice by sending certified mail to the registered agent of a licensee as recorded in the licensee's business reg registration with the Vermont Secretary of State. The commenter pointed out that that would make sense, and it does, so we put that in. And then one other change, there was a couple places in 4.9 and 4.10 where, again, just uh, tweaked the language a little bit to be clear that this can and will apply to ID hold card holders. One more substantive change was to add a standard of proof to this process. So where, and that is a fairly common thing when we talk about due process procedures, and it will likely, uh, you know, it provides some clarity for how the board should make their decisions and also may make it more likely that those decisions will withstand judicial scrutiny down the road if the court can understand what standard the board is holding itself to in making its decisions. And so now subsection um, E was added and the same subsection was added to 4.10 that says to the extent a person is contesting whether a violation occurred, the board may not find that a violation occurred unless such a finding is supported by a preponderance of the evidence. So that's it. Um, this is going to be applicable to the board's own process. If somebody decides to appeal this to the next layer, to the administrative law procedure, and then potentially into court, that's going to operate under different a different set of standards. But this will I think provide some clarity um, to this process and hopefully make the board's decisions more likely to stand scrutiny down the road. It's a little bit of an unusual situation because essentially what's happening is the person or entity who has gotten the violation is appealing directly to the entity that gave them the violation, but that's the nature of administrative action sometimes. That's not uh, unheard of at all. Um, so to, oh, just um, giving the explanation for why that is there, but I'm happy to open that up for uh, for discussion. I think it makes sense. Um, so these violations will then contain kind of a statement of facts that kind of get us to a preponderance of the evidence, and then the kind of the violator, alleged violator, will have to argue that no, that's not a preponderance. That's exactly right. So you know, it says. Can, this is what's going to be in the violation will be required to be in the violation the nature of the violation the factual basis will be there and then you know penalties and potentially a couple other things here uh, and information about how to contest it so yeah i think the person could say well you don't have enough facts or they could say the facts aren't what you said they are and then the board and then, you know i think it's entirely possible that somebody will present to the board different evidence than what the board's investigators uh, had found before and could certainly change the board's mind or, or show that there actually isn't a preponderance of the evidence to show that they committed whatever the alleged violation is. And this is just a giving a clear standard by which to measure that decision. And, and the other thing I just want to note is the language says, to the extent a, uh, a person is contesting whether a violation occurred. The reason why that's there is because uh, this procedure also does allow for somebody to appeal the penalty which is a very different type of consideration. There's no real factual question to be determined in that case. It's just sort of a general fairness question. So this is this is uh, focusing on the evidentiary issue that might come up if there's a question about the violation itself. Thank you. No problem. All right, sorry, I just got caught up checking some formatting, but I think we're okay. Um, and that was it for, uh, other than a couple other minor tweaks, again, many of them focused on that ID card holder issue. Other than that, those are the substantive changes to rule four. So, David, what do you want us to do at this point? Do you want to take some time and uh, make the edits and then do a final sweep and then we'll vote? I think it makes sense to, yeah, to take a little break here. Um, yeah, take a little break. I'll put in the changes and then be able to present 
okay. versions with the. That sounds good. And can you um, walk us through just the health warning issue? Yeah. Yep. You can give a little bit of context because essentially what we're doing is reopening with two. Um, I think we all remember we got a comment about, and I'll let David do the specifics about what the comment was. Um, you know, I was of the opinion we're not going to change anything because the health department went through a process uh, to, to get it to where it was, but I did send it to the health department to propose change. And they essentially said just that, like we went through a process. We don't have time to reopen that process and, and consider this because you know we, we just don't we can't do it in the right it was like a matter of days or right. weekend, minutes yeah, yeah. <laughs> a weekend right and so um but subsequently the department of health has weighed in and said that there i think well there you can you you were the one that had the conversation but they said that they, I, essentially that they're okay with the change so i just want to look at it and see if we want to Make, make the change. Yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly right. The, they did take a look at it um, in part that's because the LCAR process has been ongoing and LCAR uh, expressed some interest in, in having folks look back at this. So they did that. And um, here is the potential new language for, um, for the health warning. It, the changes are not significant, but they do account for the fact that this health warning is going to end up on a bunch of different things, not just product packaging. It'll end up on advertising, uh, might end up on um, yeah, advertising that isn't advertising a product, but is advertising a store or establishment or, or a line of products or also anything like that. So in order to accommodate that reality, the health warning now will just say, if the board decides to go in this direction, uh, cannabis has not been an, uh, analyzed or approved by the FDA. And then again, everything stays the same, except for where the other mention of this product is a couple sentences down. It'll now say possession or use of cannabis may carry significant legal penalties. One other piece of context here is that, as the board knows, any product packaging that does include cannabis will also have the THC warnings on it. So there will be clear, you know, it'll be clear if you have a package that has cannabis, it'll have the THC warning and then it'll also have this. But it, this works better for that situation and for the general advertising situation. And the health department was fine with this change. If they're fine with it, I thought that this made a little bit of sense, some sense when we first looked at it, but again, we decided not to touch anything that specifically kind of approved by the department of health. So I'm fine with this change. Yeah, I mean, it makes practical sense. It doesn't really change the substance. Right. Okay. And then we will approve that one as well. Sounds good. Take that as a mo approved motion. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so that's it for now. I'll make those changes. And Why don't we do a public comment oh, first, right. just in yeah. case um, yeah. something comes up, and then um, and then we'll take a break for you to make the changes, and we'll come back. Sounds great. So um, if you join by the link, we're now in our public comment section. Um, just please raise your virtual hand. Um, we'll take them in the order that they rise, and we'll move, we'll move to the folks on the phone, um, if there are any. So, you know, can you help us with the order? Yep. Jesse Lynn is first. Good afternoon. How are you all? Uh, this is Jesse Lynn Dolan. I am a registered nurse. I'm a patient. I'm a caregiver. I'm also the president of ANA Vermont here, and I'm a director at the American Cannabis Nurse Association. This um, speech, you know, my words do not necessarily represent them specifically. I wanted to comment on a few things on rule three and then also on rule four, please. So please mind me. I kind of wrote down some chicken scratch notes. I'm going to reiterate. Um, you started out and mentioned that you do not record the social equity sessions that are, I believe, on Thursday evenings, and I would love to see if that's something that you could in the future record. I have attended some of those sessions, and I think there's some great information out there, and there are some people who just cannot make themselves free at specific times, so having that recorded, I think, would be really helpful. A um, couple other things I wanted to mention specifically about the medical program. You guys mentioned transparency in the medical dispensaries themselves. 
I'd like to confirm whether that is only transparency that they specifically put forward as far as their passing lab tests. So if they have failing lab tests, if they choose to remediate their products, is that remediation going to be information the public knows that this cannabis has been remediated? Because I know those are conversations that have been had. Also, as far as transparency around their language and labeling, I know the hemp program has done a great job and put very specific wording in that if you have a distillate product, it is not allowed to be listed and advertised as full spectrum. I think that is extremely important for patients to understand and consumers. There's a very big difference medicinally and how products work when they are distillate versus if they are full spectrum. And I think both from the consumer standpoint and from the efficacy point for the financial you know, burden that cannabis can be on many patients, we absolutely need to define that language. I have not seen any language defining labeling parameters like that. So I'm hoping you're using and going off some of the parameters that the hemp program has put in place, which are great parameters, but I haven't necessarily specifically heard anything about that. Um, I also had a question as to, are there going to be more medical license available? And at this point, is there medical licenses opened up? Can someone apply for a medical specific license? I don't think I understand, you know, for sure whether that is an option. Regarding the education, I do know and understand you guys have a, you know, a legislative mandate to not make more burdensome requirements for the medical dispensaries. So I, I just want to confirm as to whether if there was a medical dispensary he chose not to get an adult use license, they are no longer mandated to fully be transparent about their labs. I'm unsure about that, as well as do they have to have any education that the adult use needs to have, or are they going to be waived for that? I believe you guys talked about it, but I don't know if there's been 100% confirmation on that. Another thing I'd like to mention, and more specifically in the medical program than the adult use, but I would love to see the adult use go this way as well. When we talk about medical, THC is not where the limits are at. We absolutely have to understand the terpenes that in our, in our medicine, again, for both consumer safety and financial efficacy. So I strongly believe that the medical dispensary program should be mandated to test terpenes, not just cannabinoids. And again, I would love to see the adult use program follow that as well. But when we're talking about consumer protection and efficacy, specifically medical patients, they absolutely deserve to have their cannabis tested for terpenes. And if we are not testing for terpenes, we are not doing our due diligence. Maryland, Connecticut, several other states are moving towards mandated terpene testing with cannabinoids. So if we could continue to push that, please. I will also continue re to reiterate that I would love for something to be addressed along the lines of patients having better access. So right now, patients are only allowed to shop at medical dispensaries and not pay that extra taxation. What we know is that the medical dispensaries are going to be providing the Budweiser of cannabis instead of the heady topper of cannabis. And they also are very far. I have a patient that regularly drives from Newport to Burlington and would love to shop local at craft cannabis and not pay those extreme taxes. So at some point, if we can address that, I think that's more legislative. While we're talking about taxes, I know this is something Tito Byrne brings up often, but unfortunately, it's, it's not something that has been taken up or the conversation continued. Having vaporizers be something that is the safer way to combust cannabis. We should be encouraging that in the adult use rather than demonizing that or taxing that to the point that it's not an option. And then we are pushing people towards using that butane lighter instead of using a vaporizer. And that is on the state and the state taxation system for misunderstanding and not having the education, though they are repeatedly talked to about it and educated on it. So I would love that also. Another thing that hasn't been discussed in a while is I know since March 1st, the program, you know, we've been looking at changing. You guys now have the program instead of DPS, the program funding that is still residing in the medical patients program bank account. You know, is there a plan or support system around keeping that separate? I know that's something if Amelia was on this call, she would be asking as well. So those are just some thoughts regarding rule three. And like I said, some things that have been, I feel, talked about and addressed, but not necessarily confirmed. I'd like to take a minute or two. I'll try to be quick on rule four as well. You guys 
it, it, I have to say it really concerns me in this in the idea of a whistleblower not having any protection. As a nurse, I've been in the situation and had to be a whistleblower and had to worry about my job and my career and my nursing license. That is not putting patients first. Um, I also feel that if it's up to an employer to then be able to fire an employee that is doing their job and coming to the state with due diligence, that there is some concerns about you know, compliance or anything, that we are setting up a system to have employees not feel comfortable bringing that information forward. About a year, year and a half ago, I worked for a CBD company here in the state of Vermont and did everything I could to, to ensure consumer safety and, you know, healthy products. Somebody that was working there called OSHA, rightfully so, because all the cannabis they were using was covered in mold. Nothing happened about it, but the four employees that did work there all no longer work there anymore because they came forward with concerns that there was moldy crops being sold into medicine and into CBD products. There was a state report. Every employee is no longer there, so there is no consumer protection based on that, and that is the system from what it sounds like. Unfortunately, we are setting up moving into the cannabis realm as well. So I'd really just like to reiterate from both my nursing perspective and as a CBD employee here that I have seen some not great things come based on not having whistleblower protection at all. And another one I'd like to just ask is, as far as education for employees, is do I don't think we know yet, but is that the financial responsibility of the individual company they work for, the state responsibility? So where is the financial piece as far as people that need a specific amount of education? Are they burdened with cost? Is the state covering that? And I know you guys don't have indisposable income, unfortunately, or is that an expense that's going to be the licensee holder themselves? So just a few thoughts as well on rule four. Uh, uh, excuse me, on rule four. Um, I believe that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Jesse Lynn. Next is Adrian. Hi there, how are you folks doing today? Great. Great. Um, so again, my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm a reporter with NBC5 News. I have reached out to uh, Nellie, who said she would put me in contact with one of you at some point today. Uh, but if you have time to answer a couple of questions when it comes to what businesses can expect now that more towns are bringing retail, uh, have said yes to retail cannabis distribution, um, I know it was briefly brought up at the beginning of the meeting that, you know, applications and such may be happening in April, if that's correct, if I heard correctly. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of just what businesses can expect, um, if there are any rule changes, because I know this is retail cannabis has been a thing in certain cities and towns already. So, you know, for the people that have just voted in favor of it, is there any new things that they can expect to see for businesses who are trying to get into the business? Um, and also, is there gonna be an encourage incentive or anything for uh, more local distributors to kind of, you know, take part in this as opposed to letting more outside entities come into the state and start, you know, participating in the retail distribution? Great, thanks, Adrian. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Um, I have no one else, and there's no one joined by phone. Okay. Oh, wait, I got Tito. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy Monday. Um, just to just to comment a little bit um, about what Jesse Lynn was saying. Um, and I know I've, I've gone on and on about this, and, and I understand the, the limitations of the board are real, but in respect to the vape tax, um, you know, there's a million problems that, with this vape tax. Um, it just isn't, it wasn't intended for cannabis, yet here we are all wrapped up in it. And uh, the most bizarre part of the tax is that the current dispensaries don't pay on the exact same items that we're selling where we're expected to pay. And it feels like, all the CCV can do is is uh, file a recommendation, but I guess I just want to make sure that in the least happens. Like just you know, something's got to happen. We we need some guidance here on how to move forward. Thank you. Hey, Tito. Uh, so Jesse, Lynn, I did see your hand go up, and then I guess go down. We, this isn't we don't generally do repeat comments in these public comment sessions. Um, we do have our kind of traditional 
after hours meetings um, where we do allow for repeat comments. And we also at the networking events um, allow for kind of questions and answers and repeat questions, et cetera. Uh, so if you don't mind, you can obviously you can submit, you know, comments to the board directly. Um, we have a, a portal um, through our website for, for comments. Uh, we do read those every single time it comes through. Um, so unless there's any other final comments, um, then I will close the public comment section. Um, and before we break, do we want to just have a quick conversation about any of the comments that we heard um, as they relate to rules three and four before we send David off to make final changes? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <any> specific. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think that whistleblower already exists in certain um, areas of the law anyway, particularly on safety. Um, I'll but I'd have to make it up. So I don't know that we need to add that to the rules. And it's not a perfect protection in the, yeah. the case that um, Jessica brought up kind of highlights that, which is but we do we will allow obviously for um, you know anonymous tips. You know, we will have a place on our website just like the Agency of Agriculture does to, to log complaints um, anonymously, but you know it certainly doesn't help if an employer then goes and fires all of their employees no. because of a tip. Well that is another argument for having the ID board be separate from the license. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Anything else we want to address? Again, you know, vape tax. You know, I think that the, the issue there is we would need to define what's a cannabis vape versus a tobacco vape. Uh, if, if we're really going to try and convince the legislature to, to not have the vape tax apply to cannabis products, um, which could be challenging. Um, but I do agree that, you know, it's a huge burden to have a 92% tax on the kind of cleanest, healthiest way to, to do candidates. The rules, the current CPS rules, are those in place now until July? Not quite yet. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, David, do you have all the kind of direction you need from the board on three and four? Yep, I think so. So it's uh, just about noon right now. When do you want us to come back? I think I could be done in a half an hour. Okay. Is that good for everyone else? Mm -hmm. All right. And then why don't we take a break until 1230. Um, we'll come back and um, just kind of review the final edits and then take a vote. On. Uh, you have a uh, screen you can I'm go. working on it now. Awesome. Thank you. All right, we're all set. All right. Well, it's uh, 1230. We'll get started again. Um, so, David, I think the last thing to do is just do one last sweep of the changes, make sure everything looks good, and then we will uh, vote on them. Sounds good. All right. So we will start here with the changes to Rule 3.4.3. I added the confidentiality piece to the end of A, which already had a related um, Related language yeah. plans to ensure patient privacy and confidence, and now adds and confidentiality to the end of that. Um, added a new subsection C in line with the first two subsections here. It now says dispensary applicants must submit plans to provide educational materials to patients and, if applicable, their caregivers. But sound good? Yeah. And then moving to rule four, we had just those changes around the, um, well, we had two different changes. One of the changes was around the unauthorized or unlawful products. And so now in uh, for the category one violations, there's been an addition that says intentionally selling or transferring unauthorized or unlawful cannabis products. And I used the word intentionally because that's the word we use throughout this section when we're talking about knowingly or intentionally mm -hmm. or whatever, I figured it made sense to 
it's the same language. And then in two, uh, so the category for, or I should say, in the category two section, I have unintentionally selling or transferring unauthorized or unlawful cannabis products or failing to abide by cannabis and cannabis product testing requirements. And the final change here was uh, returning to section three, or sorry, category three, uh, which is in 4.5 here, exceeding maximum serving requirements for cannabis or cannabis products is back in. That was it. Looks good. We want, would you say unintentionally selling? Mm -hmm. We want unintentionally. I mean, essentially what we're saying is that on this, we might not be able to meet the burden of proof of knowingly, but it might not be an unintentional act. I just wonder if selling or transferring unauthorized cannabis, which does in at least criminal law default to kind of a general intent. If there's no, if there's no specific language, right? Yeah, I think that you could, I think it, it certainly would cover it. Yeah. I just wonder if we're missing a gap there where we, we haven't found, we can't prove intentional intentionality but it certainly didn't seem unintentional. I mean, is is that does that is there a gap there, or am I just? I don't think there's a gap. I mean, I think because you know, there's only two ways you can do something, yeah, which okay. is you can do it intentionally, or you can do it unintentionally. That covers the entire universe of action. I think what you're getting at, though, is the sense that just because we couldn't prove that it's intentional doesn't actually mean that it's unintentional. Right. And I think you could count you could account for that in the penalties. You know, in terms of how severely you assess it, you have a belief that it's intentionally can't quite prove it for a violation, but you can take it into account. So like negligently would be covered under P, like someone who just. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the other thing is you could just delete. I think it's fine to delete intentionally. I'm not speaking against that. I think that um, that would just be a broad category. It could cover anything. It could also cover what's in category one, of course, but that's okay. I don't think there's a problem in, in doing that. I, I only ask, like, someone negligently sells these things. They, like, specifically, like, don't ask, don't tell me what's in there. Yeah, um, yeah don't tell me, because then yeah. it might be, yeah. I think it makes sense. I think your point is valid and it makes sense to, it's a, it's a safer, Phrasing, even though I think we could cover everything that we need to yeah. in in these two phrases, yeah. I think you're right that there's some um, clarity. Actually, it's weird to say that, but clarity that could be provided by deleting that yeah. word and okay. making it clear that this does cover any permutation of unintentionality. Yeah, I think we should. Okay, remove unintentionality. That sounds hey, good. Carol, with that. Right yeah. Yeah. I see the kind of the box. Sure. Yeah. Right. And then other than that, is there anything? That's it. That was the only edit? stuff that. All right. So with that one edit, um, any, I take a motion to approve these rules three and four um, as amended here. Do we need to do we need to go through four first? Or no? Oh, this is, oh, this is, is four. It? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so moved. Second it. Any further discussion? No. Not for me. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Great. And there's nothing left on the agenda. So I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you, David. Thanks. Thanks, David. Clearly, I thought that was going to go on much longer. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we can't possibly be done yet.